Good morning. Uh, this is the House Committee on Government Operations and Military Affairs. Uh, it is a very chilly Friday, February 3rd, and uh, we're here today um, to take some testimony on um, the domestic violence fatality report. And uh, we have with us the Attorney General today. So uh, welcome, Attorney General Clark. Thank you for having me. Um, I really appreciate uh, the invitation to come in and talk about this issue. I want to begin by acknowledging that because it is such a cold day, many of us have children who didn't have school today. So a right. uh, shout out to all the, the friends, the family members, the play dates that are happening right now so that we could all be here in person to talk about this very important issue. Um, let me just orient to you a little bit about what this commission is and does. A little over 20 years ago, this legislature created the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission, a wonderful name for a, a commission because it says exactly what it does, which is it literally reviews the fatalities um, that have occurred the previous year and makes uh, recommendations and identifies trends for this uh, body and also sends a copy to the governor's office as well. It is housed in my office, and um, I will tell you that I was not even aware this commission existed until I had worked in the attorney general's office for several several years. When I decided to run for attorney general, one of my uh, priorities was to amplify their work and to amplify their recommendations. And I hearty thank you um, to the chair and others in this body who have been so um, encouraging of the work that, that the commission is doing and, and the recommendations that have been created. The commission is made up of 17 stakeholders and the 17 stakeholders are you know, thoughtfully pretty much everybody you can think of who works in the domestic, might work in the domestic violence arena. It's prosecutors, it's um, a survivor, um, those from uh, the nonprofit communities um, who support domestic violence survivors and all sorts of other folks who are involved. And I say that to emphasize that they all came together and agreed on these recommendations to you. So these are very, um, it's a very strong uh, testimonial, if you will, on the recommendations. And the way that they come about is, is as follows. The um, medical examiner sends the fatalities of the year. Those that are related to domestic violence are identified and, um, and then analyzed. So related to domestic violence, it's not just a person who had been abused and then went and was then killed. It's also a law enforcement officer who might come to someone's aid or a family member who might come to someone's aid. It also could be the person who was the responsible party themselves. And I remember when I was last year, you asked me about suicide and suicide is included. The Domestic Violence Fatality Review uh, Commission's report is posted on the website now and you should take a look. There's a long list that explains all the different people who might be included in this universe of domestic violence related fatalities. It's instructive. Um, so I, I would refer you to that to understand this universe. So we, the commission also does not look at cases that are open. So it has to be a closed case. So emphasize, emphasize that so that you know, it's not just you know cases that actually happen during a specific calendar year. It's also cases that are ready to now be reviewed because they're closed cases. So this report, which it comes out by statute the third Tuesday of January, um, looked at the fatalities from the year 2021. The year 2022 was taken to review those fatalities, identify the trends, and come up with the recommendations. So um, that's the overview of the commission. I, Before we get into um, the recommendations, I just want to emphasize the statistics that a tremendous number statistically of people um, in their lifetime will be uh, the victim of domestic violence or sexual violence. And that means that there are people here, either watching on YouTube or here, who have themselves uh, been the victim of domestic violence or sexual violence. And we should be mindful of that um, and know that the work that we're doing matters. And we have an opportunity to make change so that the Attorney General in 25 years doesn't sit in this committee and say the, say the same thing. So we can make progress on that. So emphasizing that before I, I tuck in, I um, before I move on to, the, to recommendations, does anyone have any questions about the commission itself or our role? Okay. 
And I, I did want to just um, let the committee know. Um, many of us are, you know, used to the habit of being on our on our devices when uh, there's a report or a slide deck. Um, but the report is listed uh, on the committee website today. If anybody wants to have it up while the attorney general is giving her testimony. Uh, yep. I I'm also grateful to be here because I've talked about this report a number of times. And I haven't been able to get into the weeds. And I'm glad to be here because I think I can. <laughs> I think I have to. Um, but I did identify the themes. If you'll look at the report, you'll see there's four buckets of recommendations. Two of them relate to the work of this committee, and two of them relate to the judiciary. So I'm going to just focus on the, the first two so I'm not wasting your time. The other two are good to read and, and be interesting. It's the first two that relate to the work of this committee. So there's the two themes of the two buckets. I would say the first one is to ensure that we institute the best policies when it comes to domestic violence um, that is officer involved. And this is both, both for the officers and also someone who might be working at a law enforcement agency and be involved at, at home with domestic violence. In other words, they are the, the person um, who is the survivor or the victim of that domestic violence. So that's the first bucket. And the second bucket relates to the Criminal Justice Council um, and their ability to take disciplinary action against law enforcement uh, officials who are involved with domestic violence. So that's what we're looking at. And now I'll unpack each one. So let's go to the first one um, that relates to a law, enforcement, uh, invo a law enforcement officer involved domestic violence. So there's basically three buckets. There is, to orient you, maybe you know this, but to orient you, there is a model policy that's created by the Vermont Law Enforcement Advisory Board um, related to domestic violence involving law enforcement officers, but not every um, agency has adopted that policy in Vermont. So recommendation one is that every agency adopt that policy. Now, of course, they could do that on their own or they could be instructed to in statute. So that's number one. The second would be to amend um, one of the sections of the policy to require a member subject to a relief from abuse order to immediately surrender all service weapons. Let's talk about relief from abuse order. Um, we think of that as like a restraining order and there's a process that you go through to get one of those. And it's in civil court, it's actually a family court, but it's not in criminal court. And there's a, there's a process involved and the judge has the authority to require the subject of the order to relinquish and surrender their any fi firearms that they have. We know that a combination that is deadly is domestic violence and firearms. The statistics which are in the report um, around what happens if there's a firearm in a home where there's domestic violence are chilling. And so we always want to have an eye on, uh, on the issue of firearms and domestic violence in combination. The next. Tango has a. Yeah, just a clarifying question. Thank you. Um, any law enforcement officer involved in a relief from abuse order to surrender all service related weapons only or any weapons that they may have? Well, I, I know that Sarah will probably touch on this more from the network against um, domestic and sexual violence. Um, so I, she might have details. I, being a newer member of the team, having just been sworn in less than a month ago, was not a part of the conversation. So that level of weeds, I don't, I don't have the information on. Um, Sarah's I, already with us and she's signaling that she will answer. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> just another clarifying question. Are you not reading from the report? You're reading from your own. I might be report. reading from the report. I think I probably cut and pasted this from the report, okay. but if it's helpful, I can I'll follow you. Up. Oh, sure. Let's, why don't I read from the report? Um, so this, my report is not page numbered, but it's the recommendations and I'm starting at the beginning. Yeah. Page 12. Thank you. Lucy. Okay. I have an earlier copy. Okay, so the the second when you scroll, the second bullet is that the same group that came up with this poly policy revisit the policy to make sure that we didn't miss anything, that it doesn't need to be updated, et cetera. So that's recommendation um, number two, and then the final is just acknowledging that there are people who work at a law enforcement agency who may be suffering in a home with domestic violence. 
um, or in a, another situation um, related to domestic violence. And we want to make sure that they have supports available because, I mean, picture what it would be like if you were in an abusive relationship, if you were suffering in some way from domestic violence, and where are you going to turn thinking, you know, your partner's friends are, are working at the law enforcement agency. It's not a good situation. So we want to make sure that um, those supports are needed. So taking a look at that. And that is basically the first bucket. So very specific. I think those are very doable. Um, and we, of course, are happy to uh, partner with your legislative council and be any way helpful as, as we can in putting language together and um, answering any questions that, that folks have related to that one, too. So the next one, which is titled Transparency of Information about Officer Misconduct, um, begins with the uh, data collection portion so that we can have more information about what's happening, um, which always is helpful at driving effective change. Um, so that's one element. The second relates to, I'm going to summarize this in layman's terms, um, the, the, this category A, category B business. Essentially, there are these different categories, which Sarah will explain, that relate to um, when disciplinary actions are taken. And right now, when you look at them, they are not quite where we would want them to be in that there are, there's misconduct that doesn't qualify for to get involved by the Criminal Justice Training Council. And this, re these recommendations suggest that, that they should. So I'll let Sarah unpack that for you, but that's sort of the, the main takeaway from that is that we wanna make sure we're giving the Criminal Justice Council the tools that are needed um, to uh, effectively protect folks from domestic violence and uh, hold officers accountable. But I think it's really also driven by this, um, you know, the protective element of that uh, work. So, so those are the two main buckets. I, as I say, they're really straightforward. They're very specific. I, they were very thoughtfully rendered. Um, Although I wasn't present at the commission meetings, my impression from talking to folks who uh, participated in the process last year is that they're very collaborative, that this report wasn't necessarily even written by one person. It was really written in collaboration. So um, really good work being done there. As you see from the report, there's also a lot of great uh, statistics and graphics that are very informative and I think are helpful when putting everything in context that's being recommended. So that, that's the main overview. Um, I'm happy to answer general questions. I'm sure Sarah will be able to answer more specific questions for you. I'm working. I'm, this is a little bit of a tangent, but just big picture. You mentioned before about how many women experience harassment, abuse, domestic violence. Um, first question is, is there a ballpark figure? Well, I'll say first, it's not just women, it, it's men. It's also- um, That was my second question, yes. what's the percentage of- Yeah, men? it's also LGBTQ relationships. It's not, you know, the traditional, well, I shouldn't say traditional, um, that's my own perspective, but I feel, mm -hmm. you know, I've learned a lot over the past few years about some of that. So the, I think the statistics, because there's so much underreporting, um, the statistics are, of course, are representative. But the statistic that I read about intimate partner violence specifically was that 40% of women will experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime and 26% of men. It's, it's a very high number. And as, as we say, it's really happening behind closed doors. This is violence. This is a public safety issue that is an epidemic happening behind closed doors, which is one of the reasons why I've been talking about it so much because I feel like it can be overlooked because we don't we don't see it out and about um, the same way that we do other kinds of um, public safety issues. Representative Hooper, are we under the Fifth Circuit? A fifth Circuit? No, we are in the Second Circuit. Thank you. Fifth Circuit. <laughs> I, it, it's odd that we're talking about this at the same time that this just flashed across the CNN. Well, but the Fifth Circuit just ruled that what we're talking about is unconstitutional. 
Oh, yeah, I'm not worried about that. <laughs> we, we will definitely not uh, be stepping too much on uh, judiciary's uh, toes, but uh, working in partnership with them, I think. Um, so uh, I just wanted to make it clear for the committee um, that I asked that the parts that are relevant, especially um, the this council um, policy pieces, I had flagged uh, for legislative council, and I'll I'll loop you in as as they pick up my initial email saying, "Hey, we're going to be looking at this." <laughs> so um, they they have it on a uh, in the parking lot of things that that we'll need to work on language with, and I'll bring you and your staff into it um, so that we can bring some draft language before the committee. Um, we're going to be looking at a committee bill that has the recommendations of the Vermont Criminal Justice Council. Um, and so it might make sense to take the language that's related to them and their recommendations and have that all moved as one yep. as one bill um, from this committee. So I'll, I'll, uh, I've already spoken with Senator Hardy and um, I think we'll, we'll be starting at least with that piece um, here in the House. Representative Chase. Um, to make sure I understood you earlier, I thought I heard you say it, uh, suicides were included. Mm -hmm. And on page four at the top, I'm seeing uh, it does not include suicides and other deaths that may be related to a domestic violence incident. Um, the, the third line down. This um, is. is that did you talking read about this, something else? The definition, the long definition. Um, the full page. Uh, no, I just uh, got to that part and wanted to clarify. So it does say the fatality, and Sarah, of course, can answer this probably more specifically, but it says okay. the fatality um, is a substance abuse related death, chronic abuse, suicide, overdose that is related to domestic violence. So that's where I noticed this. And then the fatality is a suicide with a documented history of domestic violence. The victim suicide alleged perpetrator. So it's pretty broad. And of course, the okay. suicide is another. Sadly, uh, there's more statistics on that, but it's, there's a very, I was chagrined to see a very high number of, well, this whole report is vexing because Perfect. you see how many Vermonters are affected and imagining that it's magnified because the truth is so many people who are experiencing domestic violence, there's not a death. It's just intimidation, threats, um, and they're really being terrorized and they're just living among us. So it's good to it's good to have this report and have such specific recommendations to know there is something that we can do to be to move the needle forward to be protective to help people and to um, raise awareness in our action and just taking by taking action raising awareness and knowing survivor, survivors can see that we're doing something and we see them. Before we go to hear from the network, are there any any? More questions for Attorney General Clark, Representative Morgan. Yes, ma'am. One other question for you. Under the lethality assessment program, I was noticing that Crandall County, which is a majority of the district, or is that it appears uh, unknown. In other words, no response. No, does that mean no plan in place? Then? I don't know. Um, it would be good to follow up and find out now that you have the information that you have. Um, that would be good. Where would be the, if I was going to try to say you've had work, unless you could have a direct quick way to find out. Sarah is nodding at me, telling me. You got it. I feel like I'm just I'll building her I'll up. Be, She's going to arrive and have all the answers. I'll hold on that, because you know, I'd like to facilitate that if need be. So thank you. Yeah, I think um, I really thank you so much, uh, uh, Attorney General Clark, for elevating this issue. Um, my wife, Stephanie, when she started her uh, career in mental health, one of the first places that she interned um, was uh, with um, Voices Against Violence. Mm -hmm. and, um, some, of, some of the stories that I heard come home uh, have taught me a lot about the importance of this issue and um, want to support the work of the commission. And, um, and I, I just... I appreciate you elevating it today. And I think that we we may hear um, some hopeful things about the progress and I'm really looking forward to hearing Sarah's testimony and, and um, because I think you painted a picture of how stark the issue is um, and, and how pervasive and insidious it is. Yep. Um, so hopefully we can do something to move the needle. So thank you for being with us today. 
It's truly my pleasure. Thanks for, for listening. And I, I will stay for Sarah's testimony. So if you have any follow up questions, I'll be here. Well, we're doing the seat swap, uh, clarify my misunderstanding. Um, what I read was it's not related to a single, uh, suicide's related to a single incident, but it is uh, counting related to a history, like uh, an ongoing situation. I, I think that uh, that uh, Sarah may be able to tell us a little bit about that. So I'll put a pin in, pin in that, but I would like to talk about how the what, what the stats cover and don't <laughs> as we get into it. So Sarah, welcome. If you'd like to introduce yourself Thank you. on the record, thanks for being yes. here. Yes, for the record, Sarah Robinson. I'm the deputy director at the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence. And it's a pleasure to be with you all today. I think this is the first time I've seen you this by any on this committee. And um, so just very briefly, for those of you that I haven't met yet, uh, the Vermont Network Against Domestic and Sexual Violence, we are a statewide organization and we are a member or membership organization. So our members are 15 independent nonprofit organizations that serve all the communities that you represent. And together these 15 organizations provide direct services to victims of domestic and sexual violence throughout our state. Just last year, uh, those organizations helped in person about 8,200 Vermonters um, and spoke with over 19,000 Vermonters um, by answering a 24 hour hotline. So I'm very pleased to be here with you all and speak a little bit about the um, Vermont Domestic Violence Fatality Review Commission. The network has served on the Fatality Review Commission since it was established. And I'm actually um, the network's represent representative to the commission and um, have a great pleasure of serving alongside my fellow commissioners there. So as you heard from Attorney General Clark, uh, domestic violence has an outsized role in the deaths that um, we experience in Vermont. And throughout the past 20 years, approximately half of all homicides in Vermont have been domestic violence related. We know that um, the two leading indicators in terms of risk of lethality for victims of domestic violence are um, the presence of firearms in a violent home and recent leaving or estrangement, that those two things um, present really significant risk, risk factors. And while um, that's certainly sobering, the national research also indicates that in the year prior to an intimate partner homicide, more than half of either the victims or the perpetrators have come into contact with some kind of system of response. So that might be the legal system, it might be a hospital visit, um, it might be some kind of social services uh, interaction. And that really tells us that there are opportunities, that every time um, there is an interaction like that, there's an opportunity for our systems to respond better and um, to more accurately respond to risk. So the Fatality Review Commission report is um, annually an opportunity to really identify what some of those opportunities are to improve our system responses and to prevent future harm. Um, to learn from these tragedies so that they don't occur again. Due to the cases that, um, as A.G. Clark spoke of, um, we, you know, there's kind of two missions of the Fatality Review Commission. There's kind of the data mission and the review mission. So annually, we are looking at a list of deaths from the medical examiner um, and in accordance with the definition, categorizing um, which of those deaths are related to domestic violence. And there's also then the review portion where we're reviewing closed cases um, to really understand in depth what occurred. Um, it's never to point fingers <laughs> at, um, you know, where there may have been an opportunity, a missed opportunity, um, but it is also for us to understand how our systems could do better and where the gaps exist. And due to the cases that um, the commission reviewed last year, you will note that the recommendations in this report focus in large part on preventing officer involved domestic violence. So the recommendations of the report change each year due to the kind of case that we reviewed. 
when we review cases, we um, it's a confidential body. So the recommendations come out of that, the data comes out of it, but um, not the details of witness testimony that we, we have. And when victims contact, uh, need to contact law enforcement, it is certainly imperative that they're able to access the resource without barrier. And when an abusive partner is themselves a law enforcement officer, there are even more significant barriers to victims who might be seeking support. So I'm happy to, um, I heard a few questions that I wanna make sure to address, um, but I'll go ahead and just speak very briefly to the recommendations and then I'd be happy to address anything in particular you'd like to discuss. Um, the first is related to the model law enforcement policy as Attorney General Clark noted, we're very fortunate, in fact, in Vermont to have some excellent responses um, by law enforcement agencies to domestic violence. And one really shining example of this is the model policy from the Law Enforcement Advisory Board on Domestic Violence um, involving law enforcement officers. And the commission recommends that the policy be adopted by all law enforcement agencies in the state and that the policy, which was originally written in 2010, is updated um, and that the updated version is adopted. Similarly, there are recommendations around transparency about officer misconduct related to domestic violence. In seeking additional information last year during the course of our review about the scope of officer-involved domestic violence, we discovered that there really is a lack of publicly available aggregate data. The Vermont Criminal Justice Council has authority to investigate complaints about officer misconduct that are referred to them um, by law enforcement agencies. And the commission's recommendations seek to really address both the lack of aggregate data but also ensure that the Criminal Justice Council has the appropriate tools that they need and processes for addressing instances when officers may be subject to a civil relief from abuse order, which is different than um, a criminal charge of domestic violence. Um, so I'm happy to get into the specifics of any of the recommendations. Um, I'm sure that the Vermont Criminal Justice Council will also want to provide you with some um, input and feedback about their thinking around the recommendations. Um, but let me answer just a few questions that I already heard. Um, Representative Hango had a great question about um, the model law enforcement policy, including, I think that the language is that, um, that the policy should include a requirement of a member subject to a relief from abuse order to Im immediately surrender all service weapons. So that is essentially the authority that the employer would have um, around their employee because the policy would be of the law enforcement agency. So the agency itself can um, order that their employee surrender their service weapons. In terms of all weapons, that would be something that would need to be ordered by the court. So I think that that answers that question. Um, and Representative Chase, I think you're, you, your question was answered, but just to note that it was a few years ago, the Fatality Review Commission took a really in-depth look at suicide and the linkages between domestic violence and suicide. Um, and it has not been the case that we have always been able to track the number of suicides that have been domestic violence related. But as our conversations with the medical examiner have evolved over the past several years, they have um, worked with us to better identify which suicides in the state may in fact be related to domestic violence. It's always um, pretty simple to identify when there's a crime that occurs and there's a murder suicide as part of a domestic violence situation, but a standalone suicide, um, those have been harder to identify and create those linkages, but I think that we're making good progress there. So you gave a brief overview about the process that the commission goes through and also goes back and looks at closed cases. Um, there's a variety of, of different voices and stakeholders at the table, everyone from law enforcement, the network, I mean, and, and different agencies. Um, how, like, what is, are there conversations and sort of debates about what, what, it, what counts as being related to domestic violence? Like, how, how does the commission itself I haven't seen these proceedings of the commission before, but I'd love for the committee to get a sense of like, how do you actually 
come to consensus or vote or decide yes. which, which cases are related to domestic violence? Yes, so I'll talk about that process of identifying which cases are related. And then I'd be also happy to talk about kind of our commission process on um, hearing, looking at closed cases and coming up with recommendations. Um, so annually, we meet with usually a small group of the Fatality Review Commission, often the chair, um, who is an employee of the Attorney General's office, along with a few other commission members, and that usually rotates year to year, um, meet directly with the medical examiner's office, and they prepare for us a list of homicides, as well as a list of what they believe are um, domestic violence, other related deaths, including suicides. Um, we take that list of homicides and the Attorney General's office um, prepares a document that provides some factual information about those cases and we review, we walk through each one of them. Um, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, Vermont's a fairly small state. Um, and so it is possible for us to look really at every homicide in Vermont and try to understand what the fact pattern is and understand whether domestic violence is part of that fact pattern. Um, and then by consensus and using our definition of a domestic violence <laughs> homicide, we will vote, we will determine together whether um, to classify one of those homicides as domestic violence related. Great, thank you. Yes. Yeah, I have a question. It's on page five, your graph in regards to uh, homicides that are domestic violence related. Pretty stark, uh, like 2002 down to 10%, bumping up to 2003 back to 60%. Is there, is there any analysis as to uh, economics at the time? Um, what, what drove that? It's a really great question. Um, so what I will say is when we look at kind of the percentage of total homicides that are domestic violence related, um, there's a reason that we often look over a period of years because we do see this variation. Um, again, luckily in Vermont, uh, we don't have a large amount of homicides each year. And so it really depends on a certain kind of fact patterns present. You know, I, I would like to think that um, you know, as I've kind of noted um, over time, some years are definitely better or worse than others. Um, and those can be related to certain crimes that have multiple victims, um, where there might be a larger number that particular year, um, or other years where there are lower numbers. But I guess I would say I don't, I don't think that there's any things specific that we can kind of correlate year to year, but that's why kind of looking over the course of several years is a better indicator for us in terms of how we're doing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Representative Morgan and Representative Hanko. Uh, Sarah, you said you were gonna address yes. the Grand Isle County. Sorry, Thank yes. You. Okay, nice. Uh, so, um, this is about lethality assessment. Yeah. Um, so, the lethality assessment protocol, um, again, it, it's this um, protocol that is used by law enforcement and it occurs in partnership with the organizations that I represent. So um, foods is when an officer arrives on scene of a domestic violence incident, there's actually a validated risk assessment that they'll walk through. It's an 11 question questionnaire. It's pretty quick, um, but it allows an officer to have a better sense of um, whether the particular scenario that they're facing is something where there might be a higher risk of lethality or a lower risk of lethality. Um, and it draws from the research to ask, um, an officer will ask a victim a very particular set of questions and based on their responses, that will give them a sense of kind of how dangerous the situation is. Um, if a scenario screens in to be higher risk, they actually write on scene will usually ask the victim if they'd like to connect by phone with a domestic violence advocate. Um, and there's a special number that they call and they're able to be connected immediately. Um, so it's a really great and promising program. I will say that um, the Vermont State Police has adopted the lethality assessment um, protocol pretty much universally. And it is variable in terms of municipal departments. Um, 
I would be happy to get a specific list for you of um, those in your county, but the best thing to do would be to contact your local law enforcement leaders and ask them if they're using LAP. Sure. And um, if not, I'd be happy to be a resource for them um, and the Vermont State Police as well because they're resources. Yeah, and it, and it goes back to some testimony we took the other day. Again, I emphasize the strength and need of, in the case of Grand Isle County, sheriffs only. I mean, we have DSP as the overarching, but you know, depending on their caseload, their call load, uh, they are not always available. So, anyway, I digress. But thank you. No, I, I think it's a great. I think it's a great point. Um, and ultimately, the services and safety that a victim experiences should not be dictated by their zip code, um, right? And and that should be available to victims across the state. And so that's um, yeah, something that that we've certainly been encouraging is statewide adopting of the lethality assessment protocol. Thank you. Um, thank you. In both your testimony and Attorney General Clark, you both mentioned that the Vermont Criminal Justice Council has a lack of appropriate tools. What do you mean by that? Yes, so um, you will see in the recommendations about transparency of information regarding officer misconduct, it references um, 20 VSA 2401. Um, and if you Look at that statute, it lays out um, category A and category B conduct. Um, right now, category A conduct includes certain criminal charges and category B conduct violations are policy violations. Um, and from our perspective, certainly, um, first of all, a relief from abuse order, so a civil relief from abuse order that's issued by a court, um, is not present in either of those lists. So it does not autom would not automatically um, trigger a, a report to the Criminal Justice Council from a law enforcement agency. Um, it also really sits in, I think, a, a liminal space between a policy violation and a criminal charge. Um, it is a finding by the court that abuse has occurred and that um, future abuse is likely to occur. And a final relief from abuse order happens after a hearing where all parties are present. Um, the other really important thing about relief from abuse orders is um, until the Supreme Court tells us it's no longer the case, um, people are, uh, federal law prohibits people subject to final relief from abuse orders from possessing firearms. And so right now, um, being subject to a relief from abuse order is not listed in either category A or category B. The Fatality Review Commission has made a recommendation that it be added to category A in statute. Um, and I think that that will give the Criminal Justice Council an additional tool to really better understand, hear about, um, and address misconduct related to domestic violence uh, that involves officers. Representative follow up follow question, I apologize. I okay. missed, what do you call again the, um, you said there's an 11 step process and I, tell me that one more time, please. Okay, it's the lethality assessment protocol. Yes, that is the actual, that is the actual tool. Yeah. Got yeah. it, thank you. Yeah. The, um, to get back to the categories of misconduct, um, so we heard some testimony on that uh, when the Vermont Criminal Justice Council uh, chair and the uh, deputy director were in, but I think we'll have um, an opportunity once we have some language drafted to have them back in to talk a little bit more for the community about you know what the kind of consequences of the different categories would be. But the idea behind that whole, just to refresh everybody's memory, the idea behind that is that the Criminal Justice Council, on top of being responsible for training, now that it also has this responsibility uh, for you know the certification of law enforcement officers. And so as they look into the cases of misconduct, there are different paths that they can take depending on what the category of misconduct is. And we'll learn more about that in testimony from them. That would be great. Representative Marwicki. So this might be a question for you or the AG. Um, when the red flag goes up and a weapon uh, 
needs to be removed. Uh, I'm assuming law enforcement does that, but where does the what do the weapons go, and and what's the process for weapons being returned? Great question. Um, it depends on the context in which um, the weapons need to be removed. So um, the process is a little bit different for a civil versus a criminal process versus um, a law enforcement officer actually being on the scene. So I'll just say that there are statutory tools that are available to remove firearms um, from individuals who uh, are committing domestic violence in all three of those scenarios after they've been charged with domestic violence um, in the context of a relief from abuse order or actually on the scene by law enforcement officers. Um, and the process is a little bit different for each of those paths. Um, I will say broadly around the issue of storage, that's something, it's a really good news story and something that we've made great progress on here in Vermont. Um, in great thanks to the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Public Safety. So we've for a long time heard from law enforcement that there's been a reluctance to um, and concern about enforcing firearms relinquishment orders because of a lack of storage in local law enforcement agencies. However, the Department of Public Safety, VSP in particular, has worked really hard to bring on federally licensed firearms dealers who are willing to store weapons in those instances. There's actually a br pretty brand new website, which I'd be happy to follow up and send to the committee, um, which is a statewide map where individuals can go and understand what the options are for firearm storage in or near their communities. Um, and there are federally licensed firearms dealers who can store those weapons. Um, if there is not capacity at local law enforcement agencies. Thank you. Any other questions for Sarah? Well, thank you so much for giving us uh, your perspective on the report from the commission and for your work on the commission. Um, really appreciate you being with us today and taking this time, especially given the weather. <laughs> it's rough today. All right. Well, thank you all for having me. Thank you very much, Sam. We'll, we'll hopefully see you again when, when we dig into some language. Uh, um, so before we break committee, um, we uh, I would like to have everybody back after lunch, uh, not too, too long, because I, I have some meetings this afternoon, and I'm sure other folks have constituent work and, and things they're working on. Uh, but I wanted to give an opportunity for us to um, be around the table together and talk a little bit about uh, the testimony we heard yesterday on H127, the sports wagering bill, uh, and over the last you know few days. Um, and see, you know, are there specific areas where folks had concerns, questions they want to hear more testimony about? I want to check in about that. And then there were a couple of very specific things that came up in um, the testimony yesterday that I wanted to put out on the table and um, get a little bit of uh, discussion going with the committee. So that'll be, we won't have testimony. I just wanted the committee to have an opportunity to process what we've heard over the last few days and, um, you know, help us prioritize what we're going to do moving forward for the next couple of weeks. So um, we'll be back at one o'clock.